So welcome everybody. Uh, this is TUV for True Unitarians. There's not many U or V, so I lumped them in. We're really getting there. We're close to the end of the alphabet. Although, mind you, when we get there, we're just going to start wrapping around again. And we're going to start today, not with our standard introduction. I should maybe uh, have a session for people who want that sometimes so that they can hear our standard introduction. But we're getting right into True Unitarians, uh, arts and literature. I think today we'll cover arts and literature plus education and government. And our first guy under arts and literature is Joshua Toolman. He was a dissenting minister in Taunton, Somerset, England. He was Presbyterian at age 24. Then he was Baptist to age 63. And he finished with 12 glorious years as a Unitarian, <laughs> replacing Joseph Priestley in Birmingham. He wrote nonfiction on history, religion, and parenting. Carolyn Sturgis Tappan, Carrie Tappan, was a poet and children's author, and she was from an old Cape Cod family. She met Margaret Fuller and Ralph Waldo Emerson while still a teenager, and was a regular at Margaret Fuller's Transcendentalist Conversations meetings. Uh, the Tappans spent their summers at the Berkshire Estate, which is now called Tanglewood, as you may know. It has been used for outdoor concerts since 1937. It's mostly classical music, but I saw Dan Fogelberg there in 1987. Abel Charles Thomas served the Universalist Church in Philadelphia for over 20 years and wrote controversial Universalist literature, but he is most remembered for his work in Lowell, Massachusetts. He was a founder and the first editor of a literary magazine, The Lowell Offering. He mentored and published works by young women working in the textile mills. New England historians love the magazine for the social insights that it provides. And here's today's first superstar, Henry David Thoreau. Uh, we usually pronounce it Thoreau, but he said Thoreau. The best known drawing and the only two photos of him cover ages 37 through 44 and show that he kept fashion with the growing fad for beards. <laughs> Concord, Massachusetts, where Thoreau spent most of his life as a Unitarian historian's Disneyland. Thoreau was born here, third of four children in a modest farm family. Here, a mile out of town, was the one-room cabin on Walden Pond, where he lived for two years. Here, two for one, is his adult home and his place of death. Louisa May Alcott bought it from his estate and used it as the model for the home in Little Women, which she wrote while living there. Here, Ralph Waldo Emerson lived and held meetings of the Transcendentalist Club. He was 14 years older than Henry and an important mentor. Emerson also owned the land at Walden Pond. And here, six for one, is the Old Manse. The Old Manse was built in 1770 by Emerson's Unitarian minister grandfather, William Sr. And it was the birthplace of his minister father, William Jr. Uh, the first picture I've got up here is the picture of Junior. When William Sr. got sick and died on his way home from the Revolutionary War, Ezra Ripley moved in, that's guy number two, and married uh, Junior's young widow and became Concord's Unitarian minister for 63 years. Then it was a boarding house in 1835 for his step-grandson, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who wrote the first draft of his famous essay, Nature, while he was there. From 1842 to 1846, it was rented by Nathaniel Hawthorne and his wife, Sophia Peabody, who enjoyed a vegetable garden planted there for them by 25-year-old Henry Thoreau. Other Concord Unitarians were Louisa's father, Bronson Alcott, Henry's friend, the poet, Ellery Channing, 
and the political horror family. Wow. Henry's father started a pencil making business when Henry was seven. Henry joined the firm as a teenager and he kept connections to it all his life, making some important improvements. But Henry was not a pencil making guy at heart. He went off to Harvard and returned to Concord in 1837 as a school teacher. He resigned a few weeks later because the school insisted that he use capital, uh, sorry, corporal punishment. I think anyone would resign if they insisted on, on uh, capital oh. punishment. Uh, Henry and his brother John reopened a closed school, the Concord Academy, but that closed again in 1842 the year that John unfortunately cut himself while shaving, then caught tetanus, and soon after died in Henry's arms. By age 23, with Emerson's encouragement, Henry was publishing essays in Margaret Fuller's magazine, The Dial. But it was not enough. He found life unsatisfactory, and he wanted to concentrate completely on writing. So as he approached age 28, Ellery Channing famously wrote to him, Quote, I see nothing for you on this earth, but that field which I once christened briars. Go out upon that, build yourself a hut, and there begin the grand process of devouring yourself alive. I see no alternative, no other hope for you. Henry took the advice. With Emerson's permission, he built an isolated one-room, 150-square-foot house beside Walden Pond. A railroad had just been built to Concord, and he bought most of his wood from a railroad worker who was moving out of the shanty. In all, Henry built his house for just $28.12.5, which would be less than $900 even in 2018 or 2020 dollars. Uh, and he earned uh, that money by growing beans on the property. He lived there for two years, studying and communing with nature, and wrote his first full-length book a weekend on the Concord and Merrimack rivers. It's a journal of a wilderness trip that Henry took with his brother shortly before John's death, but also much more. It's a grieving memorial for John, plus philosophical and social commentary on the industrialization of New England. However, that book was not a commercial success. Years later, the journal entries that he made while at Walden Pond became the basis of Henry's best known book, Walden, or Life in the Woods. It describes his simple lifestyle and the thoughts that occupied him there. The book compresses the two actual years he spent into a single year of four seasons, using the cycle from spring to, to spring as a metaphor for a spiritual rebirth. Today, the original site has been explored as an archeological dig and a replica cabin nearby is a tourist attraction. While still living at Walden, Henry had an experience that led to his other famous work on the duty of civil obedience. On a trip to town, he met Sam Staples, tax collector, who demanded payment for six years of unpaid poll tax. That's not as bad as skipping six years of Canadian income tax. The amount was quite modest. However, Henry had a reason for non-payment. He said he objected to the recent Spanish-American, uh, sorry, he objected to the recent Mexican-American war and to slavery, and he refused on principle to support the government. So Staples, who was really only interested in running Concord, not the US foreign policy, threw him in jail. Henry only spent one night there before the taxes were paid on his behalf but they were paid over his objectives, over his objections. As he later said, under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is in prison. Whatever you think of his private tax revolt, the principle is deeply important and well expressed. Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King both named Thoreau's civil, civil disobedience as an important influence. In a similar way, Henry supported John Brown's attempt to start a violent slave uprising in 1859. His essay, A Plea for Captain John Brown, went a long way to help paint John Brown as a martyr. 
Henry caught tuberculosis at age 18 and had recurring bouts of it throughout life. In 1860, he caught bronchitis and began a long decline. When his Aunt Louisa asked him near the end if he had made his peace with God, Thoreau said, I did not know we had ever quarreled. I'll end with a famous Thoreau quote. If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. And here's today's second superstar, although not, not so much in Canada, perhaps. <clears throat> First a quote, I seem to have loved you in numberless forms, numberless times, in life after life, in age after age, forever. My spellbound heart has made and remade the necklace of songs that you take as a gift, wear around your neck in your many forms, in life after life, in age after age, forever. That is the first four verses of Unending Love by Rabindranath Tagore. It was Audrey Hepburn's favorite poem, and Gregory Peck read it on the radio to honor her death. Many people loved Rabindranath's poetry, short stories, novels, drama, and songs. In Bengal, that is, in Bangladesh and northeastern India, I am told that he is Shakespeare, Robbie Burns, and Paul McCartney all rolled into one. His poetry, drama, stories, and novels are loved, and everyone knows many of his 3,000 songs, including the national anthems of both India and of Bangladesh. Rabindranath wrote in Bengali, but he translated his own work into English, and he won the 1913 Nobel Prize for Literature for the English versions. He was the second non-European to win a Nobel, the first being Teddy Roosevelt. So it's time to admit it, uh, no one in history, including me, has ever said, oh yes, Rabindranath Tradukor, the famous Unitarian. I cannot claim Rabindranath as a member, but I do claim ties of mutual love and respect. Rabindranath was a Brahmo Samajist, that's a Hindu reform movement begun in 1828. They have been connected with Unitarians ever since Charles Dahl came from Boston and established contact in 1855. To see why Charles was interested and vice versa, consider these points of Brahmo Samaj doctrine. Belief in one infinite singularity or God. No faith in any scripture as an authority. No faith in avatars. Denunciation of polytheism and idol worship, opposition to caste restrictions. Faith in the doctrines of karma and rebirth is optional. Well, that's a lot like 19th century Unitarianism, isn't it? Both sides thought so. The founder, Ram Mohan Roy, called his religion the Hindu Unitarian Church. Rabindranath was the 13th and youngest child of a very prominent family. His father, Dabendranath, was a major figure in Brahmo Samaj and in the Bengal Renaissance and in British India, which of course at the time was 70% of the British Empire by population. And so Dabendranath's children studied Western ways. Rabindranath spent three years in England his father hoped he would become a barrister, but Rabindranath dropped his formal studies to concentrate on Shakespeare. And I guess we're all glad that he did. Rabindranath was a prolific writer throughout his adult life. His royalties were irrelevant compared to his vast inheritance, but he wrote for love. His fame grew, first in Bengal and then abroad, and he received the Nobel Prize in 1913. He was knighted in 1915, but he renounced the knighthood in 1919 after the Amritsar massacre of civilians by British troops. Rabindranath traveled throughout his adult life, visiting over 30 countries 
to meet political, literary, and intellectual leaders. So we shouldn't make too much of the two photos I found of him with Unitarians. Wikipedia mentions him staying with Quakers in England, not with our guys. Uh, but if you don't choose to remember him as Unitarian, please do remember him as a major contributor to the modern states of India and Bangladesh. Luigi von Kunitz. You can tell me that I should have covered master violinist Luigi von Kunitz under K, but you can't tell me that I did cover him under K, so here he is under V. Luigi was born in Vienna, where he played second violin for Brahms at age for the Brahms at age 11, and he knew Johann Strauss as well. He attended the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago with the Austrian Orchestra, and when they left, he stayed. He worked for three years in Chicago and 16 years in Pittsburgh before moving to Toronto in 1912. He was our guy for the rest of his 19 years. He lived in Cabbage Town and attended First Unitarian of Toronto, which was then on Jarvis Street, where he often played violin for the service. He taught at the Canadian Academy of Music, founded the Canadian Journal of Music, and formed the Academy String Quartet. In 1922, he formed the new Symphony Orchestra, which was soon renamed the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. And you can see a bronze bust of Luigi in the lobby at Roy Thompson Hall. Hendrik Willem van Loon was born in Rotterdam, went to Cornell University, and got his PhD in history at the University of Munich for his book, The Fall of the Dutch Republic. He left Belgium for America during World War I. He revisited Germany often in the 1920s until the Nazis came to power and banned him. In 1942, he was knighted by Queen Will Helmina of the Netherlands for his anti-Nazi broadcasts from Britain during the Nazi occupation and for assisting war refugees. Hendrik was raised Baptist and lived agnostic, but he was a member of the Unitarian Layman's League from 1924 to 33. And in 1942, he joined All Souls Unitarian in New York City, where the minister was a Harvard classmate and a close friend of his. He wrote a pamphlet for the AUA, This I Believe. The pamphlet said that he liked Unitarianism partly, quote, because the only time the name Jesus Christ is uttered is when the janitor falls downstairs, unquote. Hendrick wrote some scholarly history, but he was much better known for his chatty, mostly accurate histories for all ages. In 1922, when the first Newbery Medal for Children's Literature was awarded, Hendrick won it for The Story of Mankind. That has remained in print with updated editions ever since. These uh, 10 pictures I'm showing here, that's not even half of the editions. He did his own illustrations. He loved language. After 1846, new editions of Roget's Thesaurus were dedicated, quote, to the memory of Hendrik Willem van Loon, who month after month, year after year, sent additions and changes to this edition. Hendrik wrote more than 50 books, but sorry to say, the UU Biography database warns me that most of them are out of print and most of them are no longer recommended reading. There are some errors, I saw one illustration that showed a dinosaur fossil 600,000 years old, and there are frequent biases. Even so, everyone gives him credit for popularizing the idea that there should be entertaining histories written for a general audience. He mm -hmm. pioneered a field now crowded with excellent offerings from the likes of Canada's Pierre Burton. So here, sort of, is another of our superstars. Uh, Charles Gustav Thorson was a cartoonist and, at least according to this self-portrait, a schemer. 
He was born in Winnipeg and was one of many Canadian Unitarians descended from the settlers of New Iceland, which is now Gimli, Manitoba. His first published cartoons were political for an Icelandic language newspaper. From 1914 to 34, he was the chief illustrator for the Eaton's, Eaton's catalog. Well, after that long apprenticeship and after one divorce, Charlie decided to take his scheming, drinking, and womanizing to California. Disney Studio hired him in, in 1935. His work on cute Disney animals and the movie Snow White made him known throughout the industry as a character designer, uh, although not outside the industry. He quit before Snow White was released and Disney did not give him a screen credit. <coughs> Charlie never forgave Disney for that. <coughs> Charlie said that he modeled Snow White after his Icelandic girlfriend in Winnipeg and he is said to have designed six of the seven dwarfs, all of them except Dopey. Thorson soon landed at Warner Brothers, where he was the first person in history hired as a character design specialist. Among many others, he created Elmer Fudd and Bugs Bunny. After 12 years in cartoons, now in his late 50s, Charlie semi-retired to advertising and children's books. Back in Canada, he designed Pumpkinhead the Bear for Eaton's and Elmer the Safety Elephant, who was certainly on the back of my Delroy copy books when I was in grade school. Charlie was a major artist in his own right and an influence on the next generation. Walt Kelly once said, I owe everything to my sainted mother and Charlie Thorson. This is Pierre van Passen. He came from the Netherlands to Canada with his parents in 1914, though he returned to Europe in 1917 as a sapper for the Canadian Army. Pierre was a Unitarian minister, but he is known as a journalist and overseas correspondent. He worked for the Toronto Globe, then for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, New York Evening World, and Toronto Star. He covered the Middle East in the 1920s, the 20th century African slave trade, Mussolini's war in Ethiopia, the Spanish Civil War, and World War II. After he left the field, Van Passen returned to books, adding details that he could not have reported as news without being expelled or fired from his post. Hmm. Kurt Vonnegut is, I think, a justly famous science fiction author. His first novel was, novel was published at age 30. His breakthrough novel, Slaughterhouse-Five, came at age 47. It's about Billy Pilgrim, a man who witnessed the destruction of Dresden by Allied firebombing. The hand with the eyeball at bottom right is a Tralfamadorian, one of an omniscient alien race that kidnaps Billy and puts him in a zoo, because yeah, that's also in the plot. The book begins, listen, Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time, unquote. Uh, as in the novel Catch-22, the story jumps back and forth among the past, present, and future. One more quote. Billy had framed, had a framed prayer on his office wall, which expressed his method for keeping going, even though he was unenthusiastic about living. A lot of patients who saw the prayer on Billy's wall told him that it helped them to keep going too. It went like this, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Mm. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Bonnegut stories are difficult to summarize Horror superstar Stephen King says that when he tells people what he's working on, for example, when he was writing Christine, Christine, then he told them, it's about a haunted car, they always laugh. But no one laughs when they read the finished book. When you summarize a Vonnegut plot, you'll get confused stares. When you read his books, 
you will probably be deeply moved. Hmm. Kurt was raised in Indianapolis with two generations of architects on his father's side and a high society brewery heiress for a mother. He said he was mostly raised by the family's black cook and housekeeper, Ida Young. He credits her with the bright and compassionate side of his books. As for the dark side, well, sorry to say, the family's upper class life began to fail soon after Kurt was born. Prohibition closed the brewery and the Great Depression closed the architecture firm. His father dropped out and turned to art. His mother became embittered. 1944 was a bad year. Kurt had dropped out of college and joined the army. He came home on leave and found that his mother had committed suicide. Soon after, he shipped out to Europe and became a prisoner of war during the Battle of the Bulge. The British bombed the train carrying the prisoners, killing 150 men. Kurt was sent to Dresden, a city with no war industries, and was forced to work in a food processing plant and live in a slaughterhouse. He was there for the fire bombing of Dresden and survived by taking shelter in an underground meat locker. He had to help excavate some of the 25,000 civilian casualties. They say, write what you know. Kurt knew a lot of trouble. Kurt became a full-time writer in 1951 after another try at college, a few years working at GE and starting a family. He had three kids of his own and would adopt his, his sister's three sons in 1959 after her death in a train accident. His first novel, Player Piano, is about social upheaval after machines take over most of the jobs. <clears throat> this is something we'll be experiencing <laughs> in the next generation, I think. In the Sirens of Titan, all of human evolution and history has been manipulated and determined by a long-lived robotic alien who crash-landed on one of Saturn's moons. Humankind's only purpose is to create and deliver a replacement part that he needs. Do we have confused stares yet? Mother Knight places an American spy inside Nazi Germany. His mission succeeds, which saves allied lives, but to do his job, he must create anti-Jewish propaganda for the Nazis, and he does far more harm than good. Cat's Cradle is about a scientific invention, a form of ice that remains frozen at room temperature, which destroys all life on Earth. <clears throat> there are nine more novels and many other writings, but you get the picture. Kurt basically wrote nonsense about loss, death, death, and futility. But it was compelling nonsense and always somehow conveyed his caring for humanity. In religion, he was an atheist humanist who attended a UU church. In politics, he was a socialist. Here is his opinion on the meaning of life. Quote, we are here to help each other get through this thing, whatever it is, unquote. Tony Turner. <clears throat> I never feel awkward when I'm discussing people who lived two centuries ago. But with Tony Turner, I am an unauthorized biographer. I know Tony by reputation, but he does not know me. He may know some of you. Anyway, the little that I learned is all good things. Tony has been writing and performing songs since the 1990s. His works include Circle of Song in Rise Again, the sequel to the well-known anthology Rise Up Singing. He is best known as the Ottawa scientist who was fired after writing and performing Harper Man, an anyone but Harper election song. He now lives in Nanaimo, BC and tours as a musician, I guess when COVID is not keeping him home. Oh, I didn't expect to hit this wall. It's 731. Um, tell you what, unless you guys are Tired of this, I'm going to open up TUV part two and we can keep going. What do you think? Yeah. Keep going. 
Okay. Da, da, da. Keep, going. Keep going. It's good. Yeah, T is a good letter. <laughs> uh, hold on. What's going on here? Yeah, I'm all confused and stuff. Okay, okay, okay. I did not need to close it. I. Yes, I see what's going on. Okay, right. Um, start slideshow. Dang. Resize. Slideshow control window. Oops. Also, bedang, bring back my script. Well, I've been sharing the screen the whole time here. Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, is the screen showing um, religion and change? Okay, on we go. Starting with William Vidler from 1758 to 1816. He was born and raised an Anglican in Battle, East Sussex a town that got its name from the Battle of Hastings. He became a Baptist preacher at age 22. At age 34, out of the blue, he preached the message of universal salvation to his parishioners. He convinced the majority, but he freaked out a large minority. They got William and his followers excommunicated from the local Baptist association. And to be fair, that's only right. His congregation and his salary were small after that, so he made ends meet by selling books and doing a magazine on the side. He didn't starve, though. In fact, he got really fat, and he had to buy two tickets whenever he traveled by coach. William converted from universalism to Unitarianism in a, in at age 44. <clears throat> so he was important to both movements. He started nearly a dozen congregations. He co-founded the Unitarian Evangelical Society and the Unitarian Fund. In 1825, those groups helped form the British and Foreign Unitarian Association, which is the British version of the American Unitarian Association. Today, it's part of the Unitarian and Free Christian Churches. Meanwhile, at Newcastle in Northern England, William Turner became a Unitarian minister at age 21 and stayed in the job for 59 years. He lived to 98, so he still had a nice long retirement after his 59 years job. William helped found the Literary and Philosophical Society of Newcastle upon time, the Lit and Phil which is now Britain's largest independent library outside London. He was also a strong Northern voice in Britain's successful anti-slavery movement. It looks like William sat for his portrait four or five times. The top one on the left is anonymous and might be copied from the one to its right. Next comes Edward Turner. This is, he is called America's third most important early universalist after John Murray and Hosea Ballou. John Murray, who was 30 years older than the other two, loved Edward's sermons. He hoped that Edward would be his successor in Boston. Turner and Ballou were friends for 20 years, sharing a ministry in Massachusetts. But then they fell out in 1815 over the Restorationist controversy. Ballou was a determinist. He thought that due to God's love, everyone went straight to heaven. Turner believed in free will. He thought that due to God's justice, sinners were first punished for a while. Murray took a middle road. Sinners went straight to heaven, but they didn't enjoy it until they got over themselves and made friends with God. Well, the debate started friendly, but it turned bitter. 
Turned out supporters couldn't publish in Baloo's magazine, and they sarcastically called Baloo the bishop. At age 46, Turner started a war of words, which Turner lost. He and his friends were banned from most universalist pulpits until Turner published a negotiated retraction. At age 52, he switched to Unitarianism. So good for him. Despite it all, when Ballou died at age 81, Turner was one of his pallbearers. Martha Turner was born in London and went to high school in France. At age 31, she visited her brother in Melbourne, Australia, and helped and stayed to help with his Unitarian ministry. The congregation ordained her in 1873. This photo was taken soon after. As far as I can find out, she was the first female minister of any kind ordained in Australia and possibly in the British Empire. Carolyn Beach, or Carrie, was born in Indiana. This is one of our stealth superstars. She had a good life traveling the world with her geologist husband, Arthur. They lived in Wyoming, Australia, New Zealand, and London before settling on Long Island. In the 1920s, they acquired royalty rights to some oil fields in Germany. But thanks to the Depression and the Nazi regime and World War II, they didn't see a penny from it. By 1945, life was very different. Carrie was a 75-year-old housebound widow, unable to walk due to spinal arthritis. She was Episcopalian, but she really liked her Unitarian physiotherapist. So she donated money to buy a building for the North Shore Unitarian Society, now the UU Congregation at Shelter Rock. She never even visited the building. But she got the newsletter, and the minister visited a few times per month. In 1948, she became a member, and she changed her will, leaving half of her money to the church. The Unitarian lawyer who made the new will did more than that. He sorted out the German oil field claim for her, and in 1952, Carrier received $7,000 $7,168. Carrie thanked him by giving North Shore Unitarian half and leaving them all the oil rights in her will. Well, you know Carrie didn't get famous for no $3,500 gift, right? The oil field struck it rich with natural gas in the 1960s. And by the 1970s, North Shore was receiving $20 million per year. They spread that money to other Long Island congregations, and they made large grants to the UUSC and to Beacon Press and the UU United Nations Office and the International Association for Religious Freedom. In 2018, by the way, they gave $10,000 to Unicamp. And twice so far, Carolyn Vetch's legacy has saved the UUA from bankruptcy. <clears throat> so if you hear anyone talking about the Shelter Rock Fund, that is what they're talking about. John Von Shake, I guess it's pronounced. Oh, no, I've got the pronunciation here is John Van Scoit was born in New York State to a, a Dutch Reformed family. He became a universalist minister teaching the social gospel. During World War I, he was commissioner for Belgium in the American Red Cross. His work earned him Belgium's top award, the Order of Leopold, and two honorary doctorates. He wrote a book on the experience. In 1922, I bet you don't have time to finish this diagram before I finish reading this paragraph. In 1922, John became editor of the Universalist Leader. The leader was the survivor of a 100-year, 75-magazine contest in the dog-eat-dog -dog world of religious publishing. John held the job for 23 years before retiring. He renamed it the Christian Leader for a specific reason. 
he was against the rise of non-theistic humanism. So I guess he wouldn't have been comfortable at Don Heights. And he probably delayed the merger of the Universalists with the more permissive Unitarians. Von Odgen Vogt, Vogt, this one I don't have the pronunciation in front of me. Anyway, he was a Midwestern minister whose theory of worship influenced mainstream Protestantism. He came to ministry by being a journalist for two missionary publication companies. Among other things, he wrote this anthropology book for young people, describing lives in Arizona, New Mexico, and Puerto Rico. As a Congregationalist minister in Chicago, Vaughn wrote his best-known book, Art and Religion. It remains popular today. To summarize, beauty is good, and the Catholics are beating us at it, so Protestants should shape up. He certainly convinced a wealthy Unitarian named Morton Hull. In 1925, Hull persuaded the first Unitarian Church of Chicago to hire Vaughn, and provided funds for a new building in the English Gothic style. <clears throat> Vaughn cooperated on the design with Hull's son, the architect. Vaughn would remain there for life, becoming Minister Emeritus at age 65. He also served as president of the Religious Art Guild, Unitarian, and other national duties. His 1927 book, Modern Worship, was another winner. He hit on the happy phrase, quote, celebration of life, unquote, to describe his style of service. In recognition of Vaughn's work on hymn books, that phrase became the title of the first UUA hymnal in 1964. Helen Tucker. Some of you may remember Helen Tucker. She was born in Texas, studied language in France. She could speak Esperanto and she moved to Canada in 1938. She came because her husband was hired to redesign the regal suite of the Royal York Hotel for the visit of King George VI and his wife. <coughs> I never knew the QEW was named after that Queen Elizabeth. She joined the South Peel Congregation in Port Credit, that is Mississauga. When she thought her four kids were old enough, she taught at U of T, offering ESL languages for immigrants. Her stay in France had made her an internationalist and a peace advocate. She said, as a woman, I have no country. My country is the world. And yes, that is Eleanor Roosevelt beside her wearing the dead animal. Uh, Helen brought Mrs. Roosevelt to Toronto to speak to the UN, to speak about the UN Declaration of Human Rights. In 1960, Helen was a co-founder and first president of Voice of Women for Peace, VOW. She was a major fundraiser for the Canadian Peace Research Institute. One of their projects tested thousands of baby teeth for the radioactive fallout element isotope strontium-90 emphasizing the need for a test ban treaty. Charles Vickery was an American Universalist minister with a strong vocation for social work. He worked with young refugees in post-war Germany. In 1961, he became field supervisor for the Universalist Service Committee, which had just been renamed the Department for World Service after the UU merger. In 1964, he became Program Director of Volunteer Services for the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, the UUSC. In these jobs, he supported volunteer programs in Jordan, Kenya, Uganda, Germany, Japan, India, Honduras, Rhodesia, abroad, and in Virginia, New York, North Carolina, and Maine in the US. In 1969, he became the first settled UU minister in Mexico City, and he died in a car crash there at age 52. 
And last for today, we have the Uppity Women's Study Group. Uh, amateur historians like me owe our thanks to serious historians like those of the Uppity Women's Study Group at the UU Church of Halifax. They wrote concise portraits of Canadian UU women. I believe that their leader is the minister's wife, Irene Barrows Johnson. And that's it for today. We have a... Uh... Thank you, John, that was lovely. Now you're very welcome. It, uh, Thank you, so it's, it's a good, good letter. Beautiful. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. The time went so fast. I can't believe it. <laughs> time and you. There were. Um, I found it humorous, and I was also very struck because I remember from other weeks. There's an awful lot of Dutch, Netherlands influence in the.